everybody. Um, my name is Mary Lovelace. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Youth Programs Coordinator at Wilderness Inquiry. Um, so this is our culminating career panel for our Careers in the Outdoors program. Um, some of y'all have had the opportunity to explore the different options in the outdoor and the environmental realm through watching videos and kind of doing a deeper dive. This panel is going to be recorded so you can come back to it and and watch um, on your own time and, and check it out. So just to review, um, Wilderness Inquiry is a nonprofit and our goal is to kind of provide outdoor experiences for folks of all backgrounds and abilities. Um, and for over 40 years, we've been facilitating trips to the Boundary Waters, to Yellowstone, um, to many different local waterways. Um, but our goal of this program is to really show how different jobs can look like in the outdoors, um, involving the environment. Um, there's really just so many options. So before we dive in, I'm going to do a land acknowledgement. So we want to acknowledge that we're on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary land of the Dakota people. We honor with gratitude the people who have stewarded the land throughout generations and their ongoing contribution to this region. At Wilderness Inquiry, it is our responsibility to acknowledge this historical context and ongoing injustices that we have committed against the Dakota Nation and commit to supporting sovereignty of Native, na Native nations in this territory and beyond. All right, um, so just kind of a brief overview of what we're going to be doing. Um, we're going to introduce our panelists and then we're going to dive into some questions. Um, and if you do have other questions that you want um, to be answered, feel free to throw them in the chat. So our panelists are going to share with us their name, their pronouns, their job title, and a bit of a brief overview of, of what they do. And a fun fact, which is what is their favorite lunch to bring to work, because we're going to be going back to in person before we know it. So with that, um, let's start with Lauren. Hello, my name is Lauren Kittrell and I am an interpretive naturalist at Lowry Nature Center, which is part of the Three Rivers Park District. I use she, her pronouns. Um, a lot of times when people hear naturalist, they're like, what is that? Is that like a Charles Darwin thing? And it's kind of, an, it's an environmental educator. Um, naturalist is, a very popular title in Minnesota and you'll often find other places use environmental education more often than they use naturalist. Um, and my primary role is to educate students who come to Lowry Nature Center, whether that be through school programming, summer camps, we do weekend programs. I'm also in charge of our reptile and amphibian care, so I get to take care of those animals and make sure that they're healthy and happy. Um, and I'm also the lead educator for our drop-off preschool program. So those are the primary roles in my job, but all sorts of things come up. And my favorite thing to bring to lunch um, is probably a wrap. I like wraps and I like to mix up whatever I've got, especially if you're kind of towards the end of your grocery run and it's been a while since you've picked up new food, you kind of mix and match interesting things. And sometimes you get some good combinations. Awesome, yeah, you gotta love a wrap. Um, let's pass it over to John. Hi everyone, my name is John Benson. I'm the Assistant District Ranger for Recreation and Wilderness on the east ha half of the Superior National Forest, including the east half of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and probably my job is, is so diverse that it's hard to sum up into a couple sentences, but um, primary tasks are overseeing um, all of the campgrounds, campsites, and trails both inside and outside the wilderness on the Tofte and Gunpun Ranger District and doing a lot of uh, environmental analysis, including scenery assessments and, um, and then supervision of a lot of our recreation and, and wilderness crew members. Um, as far as the fun fact about lunch, um, I'm pretty varied with that. So I'd say my, my favorite lunch is just whatever was left over from dinner the night before. Awesome. All right, let's pass it over to Asha. 
Hey folks, uh, my name is Asha. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I work for St. Paul Parks and Recreation. Um, I am our environmental education and outdoor recreation coordinator. Um, in a nutshell, what I do, and I, I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget. Um, but so like a little bit of grant writing, um, youth and family programming. I do our Wellness Wednesday posts on social media. Uh, help out with staff training, do some larger events, BIPOC programming, BIPOC specific programming. Um, there's probably a handful of other things in there too. Uh, for lunch, I'm excited about this question to hear from others. Um, I feel like my lunches are usually just like a, a protein bar, like in the bottom of my backpack. Um, yeah, I'm lucky if I have one of those in, in my bag. So uh, I'm yeah, happy to be here and happy to learn from others. Awesome, yeah, always looking for lunch inspiration. I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, let's pass it over to Anna. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Bois and I work at Mississippi Park Connection and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am the development and communications manager for our nonprofit and uh, like a couple of other people have mentioned, they do a lot of different things, um, but primarily it's my job to uh, raise funds to keep our operations uh, going and um, expanding. And my um, primary job is really uh, grant writing, uh, working with donors uh, and um, hoping to coordinate projects and um, also do a little bit of social media and website management as well. Um, but I've done a lot of different things over the years and was a volunteer coordinator for a long time at our organization as well. And so I like to say that I type for the environment now because I still really enjoy being outside, but I have to, I'm doing a lot more on the computer than I did before. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. So we're going to get started with the questions. And I thought I'd start, it up, start us off with kind of just a big feel good one. So what is your favorite part of your job? And I'm going to pass this question over to Let's go with Lauren. Favorite part of my job, I think, is the fact that no two days are the same. With nature and being outside, things are constantly changing, and you're always seeing new animals and new plants. And we always call ourselves the fun uncle of the education world because we'll get school groups to come to us for a day. We do all this fun stuff with them. We rile them up, but then we get to give them back, and they go back to their school and continue doing their thing. Um, so new, new students, new things to see, and you never know what you're going to be doing. We, um, we always have fun camps going on, and just last week I got to be a voyager. This summer I get to be a pirate, and oh, by the way, we're going to cope a bird beak later. You know, it's just always something new. Very cool. All right. Um, moving along with this kind of topic, I think it's not uncommon, uncommon for folks to kind of have like a aha moment and then something clicks and you're like, oh, this is definitely what I'm supposed to be doing. So I think I'm going to pass this over to John. How did you become interested in your area of work, um, the outdoor realm, the environment? And all sure. so, thanks, Mary. Um, well, I am one of the few people I know that kind of has known what I've wanted to be when I grow up since I was a, a really little kid. Um, my dad actually um, was working for a legislator um, before I was born who was working on the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Act in 1978. And, um, and so he kind of instilled that, that passion and, and desire to protect wild places. And I started coming camping with um, with my dad and, and some of his friends and my friends at a very young age and just kind of connected with the wilderness and, um, and the Superior National Forest in general. And um, as I um, kind of grew up through high school and, and then into college, um, took some trips and with friends and backpacking and canoeing and camping and it just really all um, hit home for me. Uh, so um, I, I kind of say I'm very lucky in that um, I get to be what I wanted to be when I grow up and now here I am. So 
didn't expect to get here at a, at this young of an age, but uh, you know, now I'm just excited for the future of what's next. Super exciting. Okay, um, with that too, I think thinking about why we why we keep coming back to work every day is another big part of of choosing a profession and and finding a career. So I'm going to pass this over to Asha. But but what keeps you coming back every day or, or keeps you motivated? Um, I would say lately it's been um, the participants of our BIPOC programming. So folks that are Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, but when we're able to be in a space together that um, is safe and empowering, um, I, I, I just, like, I describe it as magical. Um, it's a, a really magical experience that's so um, unique and, and just magical, right? So um, lately, in the last year or so, that's what's been kind of bringing me uh, or making me the most excited or keeps me showing up in this work is just is being being able to be a part of that and seeing um, how it impacts folks and yeah, and just all the different doors and, and possibilities that come with that. Uh, within our community. Awesome. Thanks, Asha. Um, all right, y'all. So we're going to dive into a little more of the nitty gritty stuff, talk about um, skills and, and other aspects of a job. So I'm going to pass this one over to Anna. Um, but what types of skills do you think are good to have in your field or what types of skills have been an asset to you in your career? Yeah, um, well, different things. I think for me, like if I weren't, if I didn't find some passion in what I was doing, like the skill almost like doesn't matter. I think like it's like under, it's like trying to um, be, I think like just having like, like the determination, I guess, is maybe the skill for like um, really figuring out how to do something and problem solving. Um, I think that is kind of like the number one thing um, is I, th I think a lot of times in the environmental field, you're faced with um, different weather, different people uh, coming at different times, like different personalities in a group setting, different uh, expectations, different, like there's just so much, right, when you're working with people and when you're working in a natural space. And I think um, having some determination and um, really thinking about um, how, you know, how all those different aspects interact and, and blend together and really being optimistic about having good experiences is really important. And so um, that's one thing. And then the other thing is really for me writing because I do a lot of grant writing. So I think I've always been really interested in writing and um, like, I mean, I've been, I wrote, I started writing way before I found, found the environment <laughs> and, um, and that's turned out to be a really important thing for, for my work. Awesome. Thank you. Um, does anybody else want to speak on the specific skills they've needed in their position or, or, you know, certain skills that have been helpful to them in that? All right, go for it, Lauren. I can speak to that. So I think with environmental education, a lot of people assume that you need to have a science background, that you need to have a biology degree. It's something that you went to school for. Um, but we often find that the best educators are people who are just that, they're good educators. Because whenever you're working and you often work at different places, you're teaching place-based content. So if you have the ability to communicate with an audience, keep them engaged and teach them about a subject, whatever subject it is you're teaching, you can learn that content along the way. Um, so I think one of the big skills throughout my career has just been learning to be a good educator, finding those tips and tricks to, to keep different ages engaged and teach new topics. And oh, by the way, continue my own learning so that I get better about learning what's going on around me. So I highly encourage folks to work on those education skills. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. All right. Anybody else have anything they want to add to this? I always feel like it's so eye-opening when I when I hear people talk about this. I'm like, ah, oh, nice. All right, yeah, go for it, John. 
Yeah, I think uh, I think Lauren hit the nail on the head there. And one of the things that um, we often are looking for when we're looking for like wilderness crew members or those sort of things is it's more about attitude and an ability to work as part of a team than it is about knowing policy or some of the science-based stuff because it's a lot easier to teach um, some of the science side of things than it is to teach people how to get along and work as part of a team. So being a, a good team member, um, you know, we look at it like everyone is a leader, um, even the first year person that comes in um, and they lead by setting that tone and, um, and by being willing to, to work as part of that team. So, um, I think that's one of the biggest skills that, um, that folks can bring forward is just the ability to collaborate across boundaries with folks of all backgrounds. Awesome. That actually leads us perfectly into my next question, which is how do you, you know, work with others? What are instances in your job where you have to collaborate and, and kind of how, what have been some skills that have helped you with that and just like tips on, on working with others and, and working together. And I'll pass that, I'll pass that to Asha. Sure. So uh, the first thing that comes to mind is is some of the larger events that we do. Um, like we do a big National Public Lands Day event down at Hidden Falls, and we ask all of our partners to join us um, and do activities um, like for the community or with the community. Um, so that's that's one way I think that that um, you know we just kind of all work together in this. Um, Something that we've been doing more so in this past year has been, um, you know, bringing folks on to lead our, our programs and our workshops directly from community, like bringing folks from community to lead our programs, um, which I think, right, so it's oftentimes like it's so easy to recruit from, you know, college programs or conservation corps or you know like already established groups um and kind of to the point um lauren that you were talking about of like you know just being able to like relate to people and be a you know just be a good educator and teacher um i think there's a lot of folks in community that that can do that that aren't necessarily affiliated with a group or a program or a, a institution and so um we have yeah, I would say that would be one of the other kind of ways that I think about partnership and working with with others um, in in the work that I do. Awesome, thanks, Asha. Um, so this next question, I think, is is something that I'm always trying to work on, and and something that's always interesting to hear um, how different people kind of manage it, but. How do you deal with the stressful parts of your job <laughs> when they do happen? And how do you kind of work through that? I'm gonna pass that over to Anna. Oh man. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I was working away. That's probably no. Um, I think that um, in fundraising, the biggest stress is just, um, kind of overcoming your fear of failure. And so I do a lot of meditating. I've actually started doing a lot of meditating this year, um, generally, and it's helped a lot with managing stress. Um, and I think that taking a deep breath is really important. And the other thing that I think um, I find a lot in work is it's really easy to take things personally when you're like working with a lot of other people. And I think like the best thing you can do is just like take a step back and really just take a deep breath and kind of figure out where where they're coming from. So like listening, um, like practicing a lot of listening. So I think those are um, different tools for, uh, for stress uh, management. <laughs> awesome, thanks Anna. I know that's a tricky question. Um, does anybody else have any different stress management techniques they want to share? I feel like they're great to great to know. We can always come back to it too. I'll jump um, in. I've got one, Mary. Oh yeah, all right. Um, go for it. So I would say uh, working in a park 
a lot of people think, you know, it's this great, wonderful thing. And because I'm part of the Three Rivers Park District, we have a lot of different parks that folks can explore. But I have found that when I'm already feeling a little stressed from work and I'm hoping to get out and get into nature, because nature makes me happy and calms me down regardless of if I'm working or not. But if, I, if I'm in another Three Rivers Park, I find that I feel like I'm kind of working, like it's already in my head. And so I find myself seeking out other spaces that remove me from that professional environment. Um, so maybe that's a state park instead of a Three Rivers Park or a county park, or even just driving around on some back roads, um, but trying to remove myself from things that remind me of work to help me get out of that frame. And I think especially with the pandemic, it's been so hard working from home, feeling like you don't have that distinction between, oh, I'm, I'm home now, I don't have to work because we've all been working from our houses. Um, so that's been increasingly important. And I've been seeking out alternative locations to continue my personal outdoor adventuring without work involved. <laughs> awesome, thanks, Lauren. Um, so, you know, another really important question when we're talking about, you know, our mental health and, and kind of balancing all the aspects of our life. Um, but how do you manage work-life balance? I'm gonna pass that over to John. Oh, sure, stick me with, with that one. Um, <laughs> I have to pick uh, somebody. <laughs> sometimes I'm not sure I do manage that work-life balance too well, because um, uh, you know, being someone in a, in a supervisory position with, um, with no immediate family, um, I, my job is kind of my life sometimes, and um, I love that part of my job. I love being available. I love being able to provide answers and like quickly respond to things. Um, sometimes I probably donate a lot more time to, um, to work than I probably should. Um, but, uh, you know, as long as that's still bringing you joy and you feel satisfaction out of it, um, then I don't, I don't sweat that too much. Um, you know, in terms of other stuff, um, kind of like Lauren was just saying, there are parts of your job that maybe feel less like work. Um, when, it, when it comes to stress, a lot of my stress often has to deal with, um, you know, budgeting or um, really in-depth analysis uh, sitting at the computer. And if I, could, if I can get out to a campground or a trail and actually do some manual work or, um, or just hike and do some assessments, um, that's really relaxing to me. And, um, you know, there's the old adage of if you love what you do, it's never really working. Um, you know, there are, there are parts of work that are always going to feel like work and, and cause some of that work-life balance to get out of whack. But, um, as long as you keep coming back to what, what keeps you grounded in your position. Um, and for me, that's um, really like, I get a lot of joy out of providing quality recreation to people. And so even just going around and um, cleaning campgrounds, um, you know, that, that keeps me really grounded and it doesn't feel like work because I, I get to get out and be part of, part of the, the natural world out there and, and, and help manage some of that. Awesome, I really relate to having that need to get your your hands dirty and, and work with your hands when you need like a release that always really helps me too. Um, okay, so this next question um, is kind of like reflecting on experiences and talking about maybe an experience you had that you're like, whoa, I really do not want to be doing this. So I'm going to pass this over to Lauren. Um, but what was an experience that kind of showed you what you didn't want to have a career in or a path you didn't want to go down? I have an answer to this. <laughs> it came right to my head. When I, when I was a student in college, I went to the U of M. Um, I got a summer gig, just something to keep me on campus for the summer, um, working in the government publications library in the basement of one of their buildings. And no hate there, we had very kind coworkers, but I was working in a basement 40 hours a week, no windows. The only time I got to see what was going on outside was during my lunch when I intentionally went outside um, and I could, I would emerge after my eight hour day and it could be raining, it could be sunny, there could be sirens going off, you never knew what was going on. And I found that I really missed being connected to what was happening in nature around me. Um, and that was also, I would add, after I'd spent the entire summer prior as a camp counselor. So two very opposite ends of the spectrum. And I realized I very much missed that outdoor connection. And, you know, it was the job that worked well for me at the time, got me through the summer, but we moved on from the library career after that. 
Awesome. Thanks for sharing. All righty. So my next question kind of has to, you know, help us kind of give a broader outlook of all the careers that are out there. Um, so what other careers are similar to yours or kind of have a connection? And with that, I'm going to pass it to Anna. Oh, no, I think you're muted. <laughs> uh, it's a great question. Unmuting myself gave me an extra second to think about it. Um, <laughs> other careers. Um, I think that um, I don't really know. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I think the so doing fundraising, a lot of my work is like matching. I'm trying to think about like what skills are similar to it. Like maybe um, build like puzzle. I don't know. Uh, figuring a budget, budget analyst, that kind of thing. Um, and like project management um, might be skills that are, jobs are similar. I think, sorry, I'm not answering this question very well. I think maybe you should come back to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can absolutely come back to you. Um, does any, oh. Oh yeah, go for it. If you want. Um, so I would say in my role, right? So like a grant writer or any kind of writer would be good. Somebody with a really like, uh, who likes numbers and who likes kind of following the rules and guidelines. Um, but I would also say like any community organizer or a youth worker would be great. Um, so long as they like the outdoors. Um, yeah, I think those are the, the two that like come to mind um, that would be easy to just kind of throw in um, for, for different reasons though, right? Like one person would write the grants and the other person would, would be the one out um, in community. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to talk, dive into career path a little bit and talk about um, how you got to where you are today. Uh, so thinking about that, um, I'm going to pass this one over to Let's go with John. Um, what did your career path look like um, in terms of higher education or internships, um, networking, all of that? Um, what did that look sure. like? Well, as I uh, as I just put into the chat as a, a go go for statement, I, um, <laughs> I went to the University of Minnesota. Um, uh, grew up in the Twin Cities uh, and uh, went to the U of M um, after graduating high school and. Uh, majored in, in recreation resource management with a minor in forest resources. Uh, and then during college, um, spent a summer working for the Conservation Corps of Minnesota. Uh, and then a summer working for the St. Paul Parks Department. So nice to see you, Asha. Um, uh, worked over by Como Park over there. Um, and, uh, and then after college, um, you know, I remember doing a, um, a class project on differentiating different forms of government involvement in, um, in natural resource management. And the Forest Service really um, really just hit home with the management structure for me. So I kind of knew after college that I wanted to start with the Forest Service. And, um, and then I just started applying all over the country. Um, ended up taking a job in the, the Southern Research Station doing forest inventory analysis, primarily out of Louisiana and Mississippi. Um, so taking someone from Minneapolis and, and going down to the swamps of Louisiana for a couple of years, um, swimming with snakes and gators and, and all that jazz um, was, was a really interesting experience. I um, got to ex get exposed to a lot of uh, Southern culture that um, was, was quite a change for me, but um, was, was really fun and made for some of the best stories of my career. Uh, and then after that, um, you know, kind of got my foot in the door with the Forest Service and, um, and then moved up to the, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to um, lay out and, and do timber sale contracting kind of work, uh, which gave me a chance, even though timber was never really my, um, my passion, recreation has always been that, um, that objective for me. Um, but that gave me a chance to really get my feet wet with supervision and, um, and then the interdisciplinary approach goes into setting up timber sales um, and how all the program areas in the forest really have to collaborate from um, 
timber, to fire, to recreation, to superculture, to wildlife, botany, biology, everything comes together when you have to implement those sales. So um, it really gave me a chance to, to make a difference in terms of um, the products that were coming out um, and be able to put my stamp on some of those products um, with, with um, good sustainable timber sales that, um, that had good erosion control measures, good um, environmental protection, um, efforts that went into it. Um, and like I said, the supervision aspect that came from that job um, really helped uh, helped me compete well when I came over to the Spirit National Forest as, as the wilderness manager. Um, and, uh, and then from here, um, you know, I always kind of knew this is where I wanted to end up and working in the Boundary Waters for, uh, for five years, um, leading those crews and, and establishing the logistical work with that um, kind of helped set the next course of my path um, into um, learning more about developed recreation. And now I, um, now I get to oversee both wilderness and developed recreation programs for the east half of the forest. And um, it's, uh, it's just a, an ever-changing job that will never, ever get boring. Uh, and, and so I just love that interdisciplinary approach that comes in and, and how you can kind of put your stamp on things and um, help to um, foster that, that next generation of, of land stewards out there is, is where I get a lot of joy now. Definitely. Thank you, John. Um, so I always think this is such a, a great question because everybody has had such a different path and, you know, there's not one way to do something. So I would love to open it up and um, see if anybody else has anything they want to add or, or talk about their journey. I can go next. Um, so I, um, I got really interested in the environment in, as a junior in high school um, because I um, won a scholarship to do an outward bound trip and it was the first time I'd really been in like the wilderness. Um, I grew up in Rhode Island in Providence and like we would like didn't do camping. Like I wasn't like we were like definitely city people. So like, <laughs> I like remember my mom being like, you're doing what? <laughs> so it was just like this amazing three week experience. And I decided I wanted to like be in the environment after that. So when I went to college, um, I went to McAllister and got a degree in environmental studies. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but I was thinking I wanted to like mitigate climate change. And so when I graduated, I was really interested in like working for Excel Energy or like another climate change like like kind of working like on climate change specifically and um so I worked for two years at Clean Water Action which is an activist group um and walked door to door to do um like petitions and uh fundraising for political campaigns and um and then I had an internship while I was doing that at Voyagers National Park Association and that's where I really discovered like the national parks. Um, and I really thought that it was cool. So when the job came up in Mississippi Park Connection, that's where I got connected to um, to the national park that's right here in the middle of the Twin Cities. And I was like, this is really cool because it's a national park, but it's also in a city. Um, so you don't have to like drive super far to get to it. Um, and I had been really interested in community organizing. And so there was a volunteer coordinator position open and that's how I got really interested in bringing people and communities out to the river. Um, and so I was a volunteer coordinator here at Park Connection for six years. Um, and then kind of over the course of that, I was just the second employee at our organization. So we only had two staff. And um, so I was also doing like a bit and pieces and pieces of other things, including grant writing and fundraising. And so um, I was noticing like that part of my job was taking over more and more. And as I was doing more grant writing, I got really interested in fundraising. And so I ended up going back to school and taking a year of classes at St. Thomas and doing a fundraising um, certificate and a nonprofit management mini MBA. Um, and then uh, started doing fundraising full time, so and communication. So that's uh, you know, and that's sort of like building the website and talking to donors and uh, all of that. So I think, uh, and now I've been really excited because we've been doing the first adaptive 
silviculture for climate change. So actually, actually going back to my original passion of climate change um, in the national parks and thinking about which uh, trees might survive here in like 50, 100, and 200 years, um, given that the climate is warming. So it's been um, a really cool opportunity to um, kind of see how, um, you know, how those different aspects have like built upon each other um, over the years. Uh, and, and I think just like taking opportunities as, as I, as you kind of see them, you're like, okay, well, I really like this. I'm just going to keep doing it. And then, I don't know, it's, inter- it's kind of interesting how like your career continues. And what I've liked about working in our organization is that because we're so small, there's a lot of opportunities for startups and like projects and kind of incubating different projects. And that's been cool to watch and see it grow. Awesome. Thanks, Anna. All right. Anybody else want to share their story? See Asha trying to unmute. Yeah, I'll I'll share. Um, So I'll start by saying it took me like 12 years to get my four year degree. Um, And that was in I did like wrote my own degree from the U. Uh, It was called Education for Social Change. Um, And so it was like what I called like kind of like applied authentic education, which is just like meeting folks where they're at, learning with them, not coming top down. Um, and what else was it? Multicultural um, education policy and um, something else. I'm blanking on it. But I mean, well, the final project of that was like basically um, how to use how rap music has been used as a tool to create social change. So like nothing really to do with the environment. Um, And so I worked, you know, I like I had various youth work positions, uh, worked at group homes with uh, both adults and young people who had developmental disabilities. Um, Quit my job at one point and went to New Orleans and rode a bicycle around uh, the lower ninth ward and did a big like get out the vote outreach after Hurricane Katrina. I worked at the YMCA with young people uh, experiencing homelessness, Uh, worked at Penumbra Theater, so one of the country's only African-American-led theaters um, in their education department, Uh, and then worked for City of St. Paul, um, running a portion of our our, uh, youth employment program. Um, So it was inside at a desk, looking at spreadsheets a whole lot. and during that time, I started an outdoors group called Fusion Outdoors because I wanted a, uh, I wanted to find a place where people who look like me um, could be outdoors safely. And there wasn't one, uh, so I started one. Um, and then after about three years of doing the youth employment, running that part of that program, and a few years of running fusion outdoors just like a once a month kind of event that like I didn't like I would lose money every month on on doing that but it's like where my heart was um then the environmental ed position opened up in St. Paul and I just you know said hey I I, I want that um and so yeah I guess to me it's like you know I very much did not take the the traditional path um and I guess why I'm excited to share that in this context is so that other folks know, like, you don't have to take, you don't have to be in environmental studies or, or uh, forestry or whatever to necessarily do, do some of this work. You just have to, you know, love to be outside, be good with people, uh, and, and want to, you know, make those connections and do the work. Awesome. Thanks, Asha. And I can piggyback off that a little bit, Um, but Asha, absolutely. It's so interesting when you talk to environmental professionals because you have to get ready for the list of all their experiences wherever they've been. It's a patchwork quilt and no line is straight to the end goal. Um, Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's it's so interesting to hear about my coworkers, how they got there and compare it to my experience, but um, I started off as a, an undecided student at the University of Minnesota and I wanted to do science but I, I liked biology because it was something I could touch and I could see and experience but I didn't have the brain for chemistry. Apparently you need a lot of chemistry to get a biology degree so that didn't work. 
Um, so I went and I got a, a degree in history and American Indian studies. Um, and from there, after school, I got two jobs working for the Minnesota Historical Society and Gibbs Farm for the Ramsey County Historical Society. One happened to be predominantly indoors, one happened to be predominantly outdoors. And I very much knew which one I preferred because we were educating students in both contexts, but I really loved getting to take kids outside and interpret history from that experiential perspective. Um, and from there, I decided to pivot a little bit more into more of that naturalist realm. I got my first job as a naturalist and then um, pursued jobs at other places. And I was intentional about where I was going because they were different little corners of the environmental field. So I was in um, a, an ELC, an environmental learning center up at Wolf Ridge on the North Shore. I worked at one of the state parks with the DNR. I worked at the Como Zoo in their education department for a year. Asha, you observed me once during a class, whether you realized it or not. Um, I worked at another nature center before Lowry and now I'm here. And it was just this, my, um, my boss called it pollination, which I think is a great term for the environmental field. You stop at all these different places and you take bits and pieces and then you mix and match them with other experiences. And then you carve something out from there. I will say my journey came from a place of privilege. I graduated with no debt because of scholarships and support from my parents. I had the ability to take lower paying positions because I had the support from my family. Um, I certainly didn't live a glamorous life at times. My car is in the shop as we speak. I lived in a trailer for a summer just because that's what the housing was that they could provide. I've taken unpaid positions and I know that that is not accessible for all folks. I, even just having a college degree has been a barrier for people I've talked to in the past. Um, and it's something that we hope to change and, and make more accessible for future educators. Um, but kind of like what we all said, if it's something you're passionate about and it's something that you really wanna pursue, keep trying, whatever, whatever you do, every step is a step in the right direction. Awesome. Thanks everybody for <clears throat> sharing their journeys and, and talking about that. It's, it's always eye-opening to listen to that. So we got about 10 minutes left in our hour. So I think we'll um, move over to some advice questions and, and cover some, some topics like that. Um, just because y'all have so much experience and we gotta, we gotta share the wealth with everybody. Um, so I, who am I going to pass this to? I'm going to pass this over to, let's go with Asha. Um, but what's your top advice for someone looking to go into this field? Um, I would say uh, the top advice to get into the environmental and outdoor ed field, I would say that if you're a person of color, um, if you're Black, Indigenous, or a person of color, um, to know that there will be many times where this work is really frustrating and discouraging and um, people don't take you seriously or will like question, you know, your legitimacy um, and you just keep showing up and you find uh, the folks that you can connect with or you create programs that have the people that you want to be in them and that you know will support you in this work. Um, I think there's, yeah, there's just, there's been a lot of, a lot of challenges in this work and a lot of really, um, a lot of pushback, I think in some ways. And, um, but I think it's just, yeah, it's important. Find the, find the folks that you know um, will support you, um, keep them close and, you know, uh, yeah, so just keep at it. Awesome, thanks, Asha. All right, this next question is a little more general and I think it can relate to kind of the job world on a larger scale or, or just, you know, operation, operating as a professional. But what's something you wish you had known when you were younger or, you know, just something you wish you had a little bit more insight in? And I'm gonna pass that over to John. Sure. Thanks, Mary. Um, I guess the thing I wish I would have known when I was younger was um, how much 
collaboration is going to go into everything. Um, it doesn't really matter what you know when you walk in the door, um, as long as you're a team player and willing to learn. Um, and I guess not being afraid to fail. Um, and when I say fail, I mean, as long as, you know, you don't want to fail in a way that's going to get someone hurt or um, discriminate against anyone or anything. Um, but um, taking risks um, isn't always a bad thing. Uh, putting yourself out there, volunteering for things. Um, and, and, you know, as someone who comes from a naturally extroverted place, um, that's easier for me, I guess, in some ways um, than some other folks who maybe um, are a little shyer or more tentative. Um, but some of those risks that I've, I've taken in careers of taking jobs or um, volunteering for tasks that are hard um, have really helped me get where I am. So like um, avoiding that fear of failure, um, I think is a really thing, a really important thing to know um, because um, failure just gives you an opportunity to learn from that failure. Um, and some of the best experience I've gotten um, was from places where, where I wish I would have done things differently, but I learned from those experiences. Awesome. Thanks, John. That's great advice and always a great reminder to face your fears. I always need to hear that. Um, this is a, you know, a bit of a big question, but we want to share the wisdom. Um, and it is, what is the best career advice you've ever received? doesn't have to be the best. It can be really good career advice you've received. Um, and I will pass this over to Anna. I think one of the things that happened to me when I was like just starting out in a career is that like everyone I talked to kept saying like, well, you don't want to do this career. <laughs> like you don't want to do this. Like this is going to be too hard. Um, and it, like it was interesting because like I listened to a lot of people at the beginning of that like when I was talking to different people and I think it was really uh discouraging and I think like as you're um just like don't necessarily listen to people who are older than you just like go after it and like <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna like figure it out and like be confident in yourself no matter what, even if you're at the beginning of your career, because like, you know, as much as anybody else does. And like, if other people, like, I just think it's like very hard, like, it's very hard to like start and you just have to start and you just have to put one foot in front of the other. Awesome, thanks, Anna. All right, well, I think, I think this is such a great question. I'm gonna open it up um, to the other panelists and see if we have other um, bits of wisdom we'd like to share. Anybody wants to go? I can go. Yeah. Although to be clear, Anna just told everybody not to listen to what we have to say. Yeah, exactly. Thanks <laughs> <laughs> mind to the elders. Uh <laughs> Um, I think something that didn't really register to me when I was young, but probably really did help me get through in the long run was how long it takes to build a career. Um, it takes probably three to seven years on average to carve out a career in the environmental field, at least in my realm, in the environmental education realm. And even then, sometimes it doesn't always happen. So I like that advice though, find your space, trust yourself, and if it's something that you want and you're willing to commit to it, go for it and you'll get there. Awesome, thank you, that was so inspirational. All right, yeah, go for it, John. I think one thing, especially working for the Forest Service, um, not being so set on a specific location and anytime you can be mobile and move around, whether it's within your city or your, your local community, um, for me, it was extremely beneficial to go to Louisiana from Minneapolis. Um, and that mobility really helped me gain some experience and um, just a, a better perspective on, on the world in general. Go live somewhere else, challenge yourself, get out on your own. Um, that, that's really going to help you. Awesome. 
Um, for me, I would say, my, well, my mom used to always say, you know, like always be really nice to the lunch ladies at school, right? Or like the folks serving your lunch. Um, Cause like, you know, they'll hook you up, they'll give you some extra food if you want, you know? And so, so there, there is that element, I think that's important of like, just being kind to everyone, like whether they're at the head of the organization or they're, they're not at the head of the organization, right? Um, and, and yeah, I just, I think that goes a long way because you never know when, like, you never know when or how that person is going to impact your life. Um, either personally or professionally. Um, I feel like in my experience, um, it's been some of the folks that aren't, you know, the hiring managers or that aren't connected to where I'm trying to be necessarily that end up being really um, important in, in where I'm headed or in how I'm supported. So that would be my advice or what has been shared with me that has, has worked for me. Oh, one more thing, sorry. Um, when I graduated high school, like my plan was to be like a high school English teacher so that like, you know, I could create a space where, you know, young people could like write poetry about how sad they were because like, that's what I did, right? Um, and so like the, you know, the idea was like, go get an English degree. Um, and then that's what you're gonna do for the rest of your life. And like, I didn't do that. Um, and so the, the kind of um, the, the spread of what my college degree kind of um, holds, um, it allows me to apply for a lot more positions than I would have been able to with an English degree, right? Um, so for me, uh, even though it took 12 years, like it, to me, for me in my life, that, that has been a very good, um, decision or a, a good asset, I guess, uh, in my professional life. That said, I would also say that probably of all the things that I know that I apply to my job now, like 5% of those came from within my degree program. Like, I don't think I need a degree to do the work that I do, um, but I needed a degree to be any kind of a degree. I needed a four-year degree to be in the position like the actual job title position that I'm in. Um, but I, yeah, so if that, if that makes sense of like, you don't have to love the degree, but sometimes you might need one to get to the job that you want. Awesome, so. thanks. <laughs> thanks, Asha. All right, y'all, well, um, that brings us to our hour. Thank you panelists for joining and, and sharing your journeys and all of your wisdoms and, and all of your really fascinating stories. Um, thank you for being with us.